Okay, this video is, is sodium a brain excitotoxin? So your first thought will be, why would I say that sodium is a brain excitotoxin? Well, the point is, in excess amounts of dietary sodium, um, it causes activation of the sympathetic nervous system. Sympathetic nervous system, I usually abbreviate it SANS, you know, sympathetic autonomic nervous system, S-A-N-S. What's the, and that's the same thing that's elevated in stress. It's a sympathetic response. And so what is the mnemonic for stress? Being chased by a tiger in the dark. So what is what happens with being chased by a tiger in the dark? You elevate cortisol and catecholamines. What does cortisol do? Cortisol increases the release of glutamate in the brain. What is glutamate? It's a normal excitatory neurotransmitter, but when it's present in increased amounts, it's an excitotoxin. So the point I'm making here is that sodium causes increased sympathetic nervous system activation and that causes increased glutamate so it contributes to the concept of excitotoxicity now each of these things individually is not that big of a deal you know people put a little salt on their food eat a pizza whatever that by itself is not a big deal but what i'm saying here is that in conjunction with all the other things people do associated with processed food they're also stressed out they're also quite often sleep deprived they're also very often drinking coffee with caffeine. And on top of that, they're having a high sodium meal. These are contributing to increased activation of uh, glutamate release uh, because of the increased cortisol. So the more things you're doing to add this up, the more you're increasing the risk the neuron's gonna go into excitotoxicity related apoptosis, programmed cell death, because you're getting the metabolic rate too far above the oxygen and glucose delivery for multiple reasons. I'll, I'll explain how it all works in a moment, but I just recently did a book review uh, that was showing that MSG, MFG cause increased cortisol release, all right, in the plasma. And what I'm saying here is that sodium also does something similar, and all these negative risk factors all these things causing elevated glutamate in the brain, they're, they're having a stimulant effect on the brain. And when you overstimulate the brain, you had better deliver plenty of oxygen and glucose and avoid mitochondrial inhibitors or the brain cells are put at risk to die. All right, so here's the paper. Um, they've written several papers on the subject, this guy Stocker in particular. Sympath sympathoexcitatory actions of sodium chloride in hypertension. Strong evidence suggests that salt-sensitive hypertension is attributed to renal dysfunction, vascular abnormalities, and activation of the sympathetic nervous system. But even if they're not salt sensitive, they still activate the sympathetic nervous system. Evidence supports a role of plasma or cerebral spinal fluid hypernatremia as a key mediator of sympathoexcitation and elevated arterial blood pressure. Okay, a diet high in salt increases plasma and cerebral spinal fluid sodium concentration. Okay, so you're now also running the risk of changing, you know, some of the brain... Uh, milieu parameters, the microenvironment of your neurons. Elevation in sodium concentration activates the sympathetic nervous system in animals and in humans. Okay. Trust me, this is an academic orgasm if you understand it. This is really interesting stuff. Okay, anytime you increase sodium, you're going to increase sympathetic. You know, and this is a, a significant thing. This is not just one little sprinkle of salt, but this is when you have a lot of sodium. Um, and they've shown this in a whole bunch of different ways. If you infuse it intravenously in a whole bunch of different animal studies if you do it into the brain, into the carotid, and it's been also done in humans, not as extensively in humans, but, all right, so that's kind of interesting. Now I'm gonna, you know, put it all together. All right, so here is the effects of cortisol. And again, this is from like, I think my book review, I show some of these slides. So basically, you, with, when you increase blood cortisol, you'll increase blood glucose, lipids, you sort of mobilize for energy, uh, but you, it's also the, the hormone that keeps you awake. The opposite seesaw effect of cortisol is with uh, melatonin. So cortisol is to be awake, alert for an acute stress response. Cortisol is the big hormone of acute stress. So uh, that goes with excitotoxicity. You know, your, your maximum vigilance attention when you're stressed out Increasing glutamate in hippocampus and other regions of the brain. That's a key point. Hippocampus is real vulnerable to excital toxicity. Okay, that's why PTSD eventually starts making people stupid. So we talked about all the effects of cortisol. Okay, here is the book review. You might want to watch this video. I just did this a couple days ago. Uh, here's the title of this book. Monosodium glutamate effect on plasma cortisol. It increases it. They put tons of this stuff, manufactured free glutamate, um, into all these processed foods. So cranking up your cortisol. Okay, here's just how a neuron works. 
Cell bodies are up in here, dendrites, incoming information. The cell fires an axon potential beginning at the axon hillock. It's transmitted down to the axon terminal. The depolarization reaches the voltage-gated calcium channel. That then opens it up, allows calcium to enter into the axon terminal. Neurotransmitter vesicles then travel to the synaptic cleft, and they release their neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft by exo exocytosis. And then the neurotransmitter diffuses across to the postsynaptic neuron and exerts an effect on the postsynaptic neuron. Okay, and glutamate's excitatory, so it excites the postsynaptic neuron. Okay, that's standard neurotransmission of a nerve. All right, so here's the point I was making with that previous talk, is that increased cortisol, we know that it increases brain glutamate. Okay, fine. But what people don't know is that increased glutamate through excessive dietary MSG or MFG, manufactured free glutamate, will also increase cortisol. So you see when people are eating this junk, you know, once or twice a day, you're feeding into a vicious cycle. Increased glutamate, increased cortisol. Increased glutamate, increased cortisol. And then you're going to be predisposing yourself to insomnia, also to obesity. A lot of people say, oh, I'm fat, I can't lose the weight, I'm trying to eat better. Well, are you paying attention to stuff like this? This is why you should eat zero processed food. That's also why, you know, I made another video just recently, why I don't sugarcoat it. I just tell people, don't eat any processed food, zero. Don't eat anything with more than one ingredient. The reason is, some people are more vulnerable than others to the side effects of eating this way. It's like, just like it goes, you don't tell an alcoholic you can drink on the weekends. You don't tell a cigarette smoker you can smoke on the weekends. You don't smoke anymore. You don't drink anymore. That's, that's how you have your best chance to get better, to improve. Because the default setting is to not improve. Most patients have, don't age well. They have bad outcomes. If you want to be a winner in the game of health, you have to play for keeps. Play to be the best. And that's what you should do. If you try to be the best you could be, you'll keep on making progress and fixing problems as you go along. If you just say, well, you know, I'm not as fat as my cousin, I'm doing okay. Well, when you half-ass it, then you end up with half-ass results. You really don't do as well as you like. Because the older you get, the more fragile you get. So what might have worked when you were 50 might not be enough when you're 55 or 60. So the smart move is just do everything as well as you can. And in so doing, you, you learn as you go along. Okay, so here's another typical synapse. It's a little more complex, but it's the same concept. This is called a tripartite synapse. So here's the presynaptic neuron, here's the postsynaptic neuron, and this would be the adjacent astrocyte. They're kind of called the mama cells, the so supporting cells of the brain. They also call them glia, because glia means like glue. And they, 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 they connect to the synapse and they help make it run well. Okay, so the presynaptic neuron re releases glutamate to the postsynaptic neuron and binds the receptors, exerts an excitatory effect. What's unique about this slide is I drew cortisol on here. So cortisol is a glucocorticoid, the stress hormone. It binds to, well, it actually it crosses the membrane. It binds to an intracellular receptor, but it can also have a non-genomic effect to increase glutamate transmission here. The point is cortisol exerts an effect on the presynaptic neuron to release more glutamate, more glutamate, more glutamate, okay? And you also know that um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're psychologically stressed out, if you have caffeine, if you're sleep deprived, all those things are gonna increase glutamate release at this uh, neuron. And so what I'm saying is it now turns out that excess dietary sodium is also gonna lead to elevation of cortisol. So like caffeine, not, it's certainly not gonna do it as much as caffeine, but it's still gonna contribute to that type of effect, okay? If you're drinking aspartame, the aspartame can bind over, I'll show you on a different slide that other stuff. Okay, here is a, a synapse, a little more detail here. If you eat a high-fat diet, you, you get increased insulin in the blood. That uses up the insulin-degrading enzyme, so then you get elevated beta-amyloid protein because insulin-degrading enzyme also clears beta-amyloid protein. And the point I'm making is then the beta-amyloid protein diffuses from the periphery back into the CNS, central nervous system, the brain, and it can bind these NMDA receptors and cause them to become increasingly open, increase activity, okay? Lots of people are magnesium deficient because they don't eat enough plant foods. Magnesium's in the center of chlorophyll, so you eat your plant foods, you get magnesium. So anyways, magnesium deficient persons have less complete of a block in the center of the NMDA receptor, and therefore this NMDA receptor is predisposed to being hyperactive, hyper open, allowing more calcium into the cell. So you see how multiple screw jobs are simultaneously happening. The high fat diet is screwing you, because you're, you're gonna have more beta amyloid protein going into your brain to open up these receptors. If you're eating the processed food like the uh, uh, GP sprayed soy, like the typical chump eats, okay, that GP also activates the NMDA receptor because it's glycine. It's a coincident receptor, meaning that it binds not only glutamate, it also binds glycine to activate it. And it's thought that the increased availability of, of glycine 
which it basically is like glycine phosphate is what GP is, essentially. There's a tiny bit more to it than that, but that's essentially what it is. Um, it's an excitotoxin. Okay, then if you have aspartame, you know, common, common sweetener, that activates this, all right? Uh, so you can see there's a lot of ways you can increase the activity of this NMDA receptor. Being deficient in magnesium, okay, and what I'm sort of saying now too is now your sodium's opening up, increasing the cortisol effect on here. You're just multiplying the ways that you're getting more glutamate into that synapse. You don't want to do that. It's not in your interest at all to do that. Oh, and here's a mnemonic for my theory of neurodegeneration. Just rosy, okay? This one's real easy. Rosy, R for Rogers, O for oxygen and glucose delivery. You got to get more oxygen and glucose delivery up to those brain cells. So basically, you got a, a baseline metabolic rate, and then you, it's coupled, or supply and demand must be equal for metabolic rate of the neuron and the oxygen and glucose delivery. If you diminish the oxygen and glucose delivery because you got congestive heart failure, atrial fibrillation, overtreated hypertension, intracranial atherosclerosis, then the neuron will not get enough oxygen and glucose to meet its metabolic demands, and it could potentially die, especially when that's a chronic thing day after day for months. Okay, um, other things that are related to that. If you have obstructive sleep apnea, sleep apnea patients, you put a pulse ox on them, they're dropping their oxygen level sometimes quite a bit. So you got hypoxia. That means you can't run your mitochondria to make more ATP energy to pump out the calcium, all right? Then let's say your typical diabetic used to only check themselves with a finger stick one, two, or three times a day. Nowadays, they can put a continuous glucose monitor on their finger, and a lot of them are overdosing their diabetes medications, and they're dropping their blood sugar at night. So they got nighttime hypoglycemia. You couple nighttime hypoglycemia of a diabetic with obstructive sleep apnea. Lots of diabetics are sleep apneics. And now they're hypoxic and they're hypoglycemic, meaning they got low oxygen, low glucose going to their brain cells at night. Not good. This is a recipe for stupidity, okay? Uh, neuron cells die when they can't get enough uh, energy to meet their metabolic demand. Plus, on top of it, the processed food, they're always going to put mold inhibitors in there so it doesn't get mold grown in it, get sent back to the, the company that makes it. They lose money on that. Well, guess what? Mold inhibitors routinely are mitochondria inhibitors. Tons of things are mitochondria inhibitors. Statins, fluoroquinolone, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, antidepressants, Tylenol, BPA, HG, AL, F minus, high fat diets, especially sap fat. It goes on and on. So when you, uh, here I got I for inhibitors, a mitochondria, also circa inhibitors, sarcoplasm, endoplasmic reticulum, calcium ATPase, the other calcium pump to get calcium out of the cytoplasm. So the point I'm saying is lots of people got 10, 15, 20 of these things simultaneously. Big surprise, they're stupid. I would expect it. Okay, so that's why, that's why, you know, my theory of neurodegeneration is the best one because it tells you. I, I, I got, I've lectured about this in more detail. I go through all the individual items, but here's the gist of it in a little more detail. Basically, MR is for metabolic rate. GOD is for glucose oxygen delivery. As a, most people always call it OGD. As a joke, I made it GOD. I think you get the joke. Okay, so you got to be able to, supply and demand have to be matched so you get enough supply that you can meet the metabolic rate of that neuron. Otherwise, you, you get this gap too far apart between metabolic rate metabolic rate and uh, glucose oxygen delivery and ATP production capacity for all the reasons we just talked about. These neurons will die. And when I look at all these, I see many, many thousands of demented brains and cognitively impaired brains. By far, the most common thing is I see a diffusely shrunken brain. I don't see the nonsense, Alzheimer's, you know, parietal, medial, temporal uh, pattern that often. Okay, so anyways, uh, that was the point. So the whole point of this lecture was sodium is contributing to this risk of cognitive impairment in more ways than one. It's a vasoconstrictor decreasing blood supply to the brain. Um, it's also, though, an increaser of sympathetic activity. Thus, it has an excitotoxic effect. Yes, it's a small excitotoxic effect, but when you add it to all these other things, you run the risk of a synergistic um, neurotoxicity.